If you have your Bibles with you, would you please turn to Zechariah chapter 12. As you're thinking about that, I want you to be thinking about the game of football. Imagine you're on a football team and you have the best players, you have the best coach, you have the best equipment, you have the best owner, you have all the money you need, there's no salary cap, and you are undefeated and you are going to the Super Bowl. And your opponent in that Super Bowl has inferior players, inferior coaching, inferior facilities, and you expect to just blow them away. And so does everybody else. But what you don't know is that other team actually has another coach. And that coach knows your playbook. He knows exactly what you will do, and he knows what he will do. And beyond that, that coach is a player coach. And he is more skilled, and he is stronger, and he is faster, better trained, better equipped than anybody else on the field. And when he plays, he makes everybody better. And beyond that, he has written down for everybody exactly what he's going to do. Well, that's what we have in Zechariah chapter 12. What you have here is the end of the Great Tribulation. And you have all of these godless nations. And what they have done is they have given their authority to Antichrist. And they will send their armies from all over the world against Israel. That's what they will do. Satan hates God. And he knows Israel is God's plan to take his glory and spread his name to the nations. So he hates Israel as well. And he seeks to destroy it. And he is going to do that or aim to do that using the armies of the world. Scripture tells us that these armies will gather together and they will draw upon all of their might, all of their resources, all of their means. And their one objective is to obliterate Israel and to remove it from the face of the earth in the battle that our Bible tells us is Armageddon. These armies will be brimming with confidence as they line up against an overmatched band of Jewish people. But what they don't know is that no matter how powerful they are, no matter how numerous they are, no matter how united they are in their aim, that God is actually positioning them for his purposes for Jerusalem. What God has is, is one final move that he is going to make uh, in this era of human history, and that move will supersede everything that these nations have planned, and he will actually end up annihilating them. They will literally play themselves right into God's hands. So the punchline for this oracle, this is the second of the two oracles, and it goes from chapters 12, 13, and 14, is that God already knows what the nations plan to do, and he will bring those nations to ruin. So today what we're going to see is that in the face of annihilation by the greatest military force ever existed, God will rescue Israel in two ways. He will rescue them with a physical salvation and he will rescue them with a spiritual salvation. So we're going to look at verses one through nine and take a look at the physical salvation that he brings to them. But we need to get something clear first, and that is that whenever you think about salvation of any kind, whether it's physical or spiritual, you need to acknowledge that the giver of that salvation is completely sovereign over everything that's involved in that salvation. Otherwise, he simply could not bring that salvation to pass. So we have to get that straight first, and that's exactly what you have and exactly what you see in verse 1 as we go through this. Israel's physical salvation involves a sovereign enabling let me read verse 1 for us. The oracle of the word of Yahweh concerning Israel. Thus declares Yahweh, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. We've discussed this already, what an oracle is. An oracle is a burden. It is a weighty message that is coming for something that will certainly come to pass. But this oracle is concerning Israel. The last oracle that's in chapters 9, 10, and 11 was an oracle that was against Hadrach. It was against Syria. But here the oracle is concerning Israel. And for those Israelites, those Jews that God is going to save, he is working for them. So this is a weighty message, but it's a message of how God is working for Israel. So God is telling Israel in this oracle, I have 
something in store for you, and that is very, very good. And you will know it will come to pass because I am transcendent over everything. God tells us here, I stretched out the heavens. God is saying, I can control things, and I do control things that you cannot see. They're beyond you. You operate on, based on what you see and what you know, but I control all of those things, and I control everything that is beyond what you see. I can save you because I control the universe. Then God goes on to say, I laid the foundation of the earth. I actually set the foundation of what you're standing on. I provide you with stability and equilibrium in this world, this world that you live in. I can save you because I control this world. So God talks about what's beyond man, and then he talks about what is right under man, and then he talks about what's within man. He says, I formed the spirit of man within him. God is saying, I know mankind intimately. I know you materially. I know all of your needs. I know all your characteristics and all your requirements for living. I know everything you need. But I also know you spiritually. I know your true condition before me better than you do. I can save you because I know you. What God is saying is, you need to know about me so that you will have no reason to fear And you can be sure that my word will come to pass. And what will come to pass is an unexpected obstacle. That's our next point that we're going to see here. Israel's physical salvation involves an unexpected obstacle. We'll see that in verses 2 and 3. And there's uh, two word pictures that we need to keep in mind as we read this. One is the word picture of a cup. And the other is the word picture of a stone. But before we go through this passage, take a look in the middle of verse 2. And then notice in verse 3 that he's making reference to all the peoples around, the one in siege, and all the nations. These are the three different terms for the same group. And that group is the armies that are surrounding Jerusalem and have pervaded all of Judah. So this is a massive army that surrounded Jerusalem, and it is so numerous that its, its, foot, its footprint extends not only around Jerusalem, but in all the areas of Judah. This is a truly enormous army. And God is speaking about this army. I want us to turn in our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 38 and see exactly what God says about this army. Ezekiel 38 verse 16. God is speaking in this context of of the armies that will descend upon the promised land, Israel, at the end of the seven-year great tribulation time. Ezekiel 38 verse 16. God is speaking directly to these nations. He says, you will come up against my people, my people Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. These armies, these people that will come, will literally saturate Israel. Any reasonable assessment would conclude that Israel is toast, that they are done. They look at the opposition, they look at themselves, and they would conclude, within ourselves, we have no hope in this situation. But as I read this, notice the ways that Israel is an obstacle to those nations. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples all around. Now the one in siege against Jerusalem will also be against Judah, but it will be in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who heave it up will be severely injured, and all the nations of earth will be gathered against it. Notice the sovereign hand of God at the beginning of this passage. I am going to make Jerusalem. This is consistent with what God told them in verse 1. A God who knows everything and who's laid the foundations of the earth and spread out the heavens in front of you and, and knows the interior of man's heart, he is the one and he alone is the one who can make Jerusalem anything to their opponents. And what God will make them is an instrument of his divine wrath. They will be a cup that causes reeling. Now, Israel is going to be very small compared to the other nations, But when that cup is tilted, we have to be very careful and observe what will spill out. What will spill out is something that is totally unexpected, completely unexpected. It will not be the blood of Israel that spills out when this cup is tilted. What will spill out is the holy wrath of God against the nations. When we think about a cup, we normally think of something that we hold in our hand and we consume by ourselves. That's not what's in view here. What's in view here is a vessel that many drink from all in the same setting, all at the same time. 
So the nations together, the multitude of nations, the multiple nations that will come to Israel, they together will attempt to destroy Jerusalem and all the surrounding lands, but together they will drink God's wrath for it. So the nations, they expect that the contents of this cup will be sweet, but what they don't know is that it will be the bitter wrath of God against them. And it's going to cause reeling. And the Hebrew word for this is very, very interesting. It means to wobble and to stumble yourself. The ground will feel as if the enemies, to the enemies, as if it's moving underneath them. If we go back to Ezekiel 38, just advance a couple of verses to verse 19. We'll see exactly how it is that that's going to come to pass. In verse 19, after God describes this nation, this nation that's going to descend upon Israel like a cloud, he says, in my zeal and in my blazing fury, I have spoken that on that day, there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. On that day that they descend and they gather together for the the great battle of Armageddon, God will bring an earthquake to the land because that earthquake is part of God's wrath against the nations and it's part of his plan for the physical salvation of Israel. But in addition to being a cup, Israel will also be a stone. Verse three, it will be in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who heave it up will be severely injured and all the nations will be gathered against it. Again, you see this phrase in that day. If you look in this passage, you'll notice that that phrase occurs seven times. And if you look throughout scripture for the eschatological meanings, and if you look in all of the different passages that talk about the end times and all of the different apocalyptic passages, you'll see the word in that day or the phrase in that day used to represent two different things. In some occasions, it really is referring to an era or a period of time. But in this particular location, all seven of these references are to one particular day. And that's the day of the battle at Armageddon. And God again says, I will make. And that reiterates all of the authority and all the power that we see in verse 1 and we see come to pass in verse 2. Israel doesn't make themselves a heavy stone. God makes them a heavy stone. They're a heavy stone and a heavy stone is something that's immovable. It's it's something that, that you cannot move. And Israel cannot be removed and displaced from the promised land. It's what God is saying. They are so important to me. I have given them this land. I have covenanted with them that this is their land. And they are going to be a heavy stone and they are not going to be displaced. And you can see there the reference to all who heave it up. Those are those who attempt to pick up this stone and move it. Who attempt to displace these people from the land that God promised them. And God's promise is those people will be severely injured. And this is, this is not something that you can recover from. This injury is not something that can be cured medically. It's not something that can be fixed with a a surgery. This is not something you recover from. This is a deep penetrating fatal wound. So the physical salvation of Israel brings forth this unexpected obstacle, but it also produces a specific incapacity in that army. So let's take a look at that in verses four and five. As we do that, we need to remember what Jesus did to the Antichrist back in chapter 11. So flip back to chapter 11, verse 17, and remind ourselves that a sword will be on Antichrist's arm and on his right eye, and his right eye will be utterly dimmed. Jesus is going to bring a sword to the arm and to the eye of Antichrist, completely removing him of his sight and his strength. God is acting in a similar way to the nations here. And as I read this passage, notice the loss of capacity in the horses and their riders. It's specifically related related to their ability to see. Verse 4, in that day describes, declares Yahweh, I will strike every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness. But I will open my eyes to watch over the house of Judah while I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Again, you see that reference to that one day. God is going to act on one day here. And it clearly is God who's acting. I will. It's God who is doing this. What he's going to do is he's going to strike every horse with bewilderment. That horse that is a a sign and a symbol of strength and power and advantage 
in military matters. God says, whatever advantage you think you contain and you think you possess through these horses, I am going to neutralize it. We see more about the horse at the end of the verse. Every horse of the peoples will be struck with blindness. You need eyesight to observe your enemy. If you don't have any eyesight, you really have no knowledge of what your enemy or your opponent is doing. Think back to the football field. What happens if your quarterback is blind or your field goal kicker is blind or your receiver is blind? It doesn't work out too well. God also strikes the rider of those horses with madness. So not only are the horses that the rider's on blind, but those that are riding on them are struck with madness. They're going to be acting irrationally and wildly, and it's going to result in utter chaos for them, just like on the football field. But the soldier is blind as well. And it's not stated here. It's, it's stated in chapter 14. So flip ahead a couple of chapters and go to verse 12. This again is another description of what is taking place in this same event. And we'll get there in a couple of weeks. This will be the plague which Yahweh will plague all the peoples. Those are the nations that are around them who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet and their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongue will rot in their mouth. There's a lot of rotting going on there, and much of it is in their eyes. They won't be able to see. So just like their horses, they will be blind. Confusion and chaos will abound. Back to chapter 12. Look at what God says about himself. He says, after all of these things, the horses are going to become blind. The riders are going to become blind. God says, I will open my eyes. God is telling Israel, I am fully cognizant about you. And of you, I am very perceptive. The reason for that is because I am the defender of you as a people. I will watch over the house of Judah. God will open his eyes in a new way. It's not as if God was blind throughout human history, but God is seeing Israel in a way that they need him to see them, to rescue them. So the nations have arrayed themselves against Israel and they are zealous and they are confident, but God has incapacitated them. Eric is going to be teaching us tonight from Psalm 2. I want us to turn to Psalm 2 and just take a look at verses 1 and 4 and see how it fits so well with this context. And again, I'm not going to steal Eric's thunder for tonight, but uh, the psalmist writes, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? In verse 4, He who sits in heaven laughs. God is saying to these armies, you may possess some strength, and I gave that to you, but I am the creator of the universe, and your striving against me is laughable. It is vanity to strive against the Lord, and woe to those who attempt to do so. Let's go back to Zechariah chapter 12. Let's look at verse 5. The clans of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us, are the inhabitants of Jerusalem through Yahweh of hosts, their God. When we read about the, the clans of Judah, we need to make sure we understand here that what is being described is not just the people who are in Jerusalem, but it's talking about the people of Judah, all the people of Judah, and all of them are involved in this battle. And they will say, notice that they will say, which means that they understand something. They're going to express something. And what they understand is that the inhabitants of Jerusalem are a strong support for them, but they are a strong support for them through Yahweh of hosts. This is the first time that Israel is beginning to understand something. They're beginning to realize that, that Messiah Christ is actually Yahweh of hosts, their personal deliverer. And the first ones to realize that are the ones who live out in the countryside, who live out throughout Judah. And they're going to say it in their hearts. They're not just noticing this with, with open perception, but they actually see it in their hearts, in the inner man. So in addition to conquering Israel's enemies, God is also conquering Israel's hardness of heart right here in this verse. He's beginning that process. So the physical salvation of Israel also produces a fiery defeat. After God gets done incapacitating the armies, 
then he torches them. And we're going to read about that in verse 6. In that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fiery laver among the pieces of wood and a fiery torch among the sheaves. So they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples, while Jerusalem will again be inhabited in its own place in Jerusalem. In that day, I will make same time frame, same sovereignty. God is telling Israel again and again, there is one day coming and I'm going to make this happen. God has just gotten done describing what he's going to do to those people. Here he describes how he's going to do it in another way. He speaks about the clans of Judah. God is using weak Judah to defeat these superpowers. We need to just let that sink in for a minute. All of the nations of the world are going to be gathered against Israel. Every single one of them will, will hate them. Every single one of them will be disposed against them because they are the ones who represent God's plan for the world. When we think about a fiery laver, what that is, is that's a, that's a piece of wood that's burning and it's used to start a fire. The wood is ignited by the laver. So in the way that, that a laver ignites wood around it, the people of Judah are going to be ones that ignite the armies around them. They're going to be burst into flames, figuratively speaking. Sheaves are the same thing. Sheaves are what is left over after the harvest is reaped. It's all of the dead material after the fruit and the harvest has been taken. And it burns really easily when a torch is applied to it. This is what it's going to be like for all of those armies when they are around Israel, when they are around the people of Judah. And notice that it says they're going to consume on the right and the left side. So Israel is going to consume these nations with the wrath of God in every place on the right and in every place on the left. What that tells us is that nobody will escape. And this is really significant because when you read your Bible in the Old Testament and you read about battles that take place and it becomes clear to one of the members in that battle that the other, that their opponent is superior, they flee. And in the course of that flight, they're pursued by the other army and many of them are killed in flight, but, but some of them do escape to some kind of safety somewhere. God is saying that isn't going to happen here. Every single one of these soldiers that is going to be arrayed against Israel, every last one of them from all of the armies of the world will lose their life. There will be no survivors whatsoever. And it ends with really encouraging news for the people of Israel. Jerusalem again will be inhabited in its own place. So Jerusalem itself will survive the war and it won't need to be rebuilt because it won't sustain any significant substantial damage. So the physical salvation produces a fiery defeat and it produces again with that a supernatural defense. And that's our next point. And we'll see that in verses seven through nine. And what Zechariah does here is he moves away from what God will do to the nations to what God will do for Israel. And the first on that list are the people in Judah, the people in the countryside. And we see that in verse seven. Yahweh also will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. So what God is doing here is he is asserting his valuation of all Jews He's helping the people of Jerusalem understand you are not ahead of everybody else in this land. There are others who I value just as highly as you. God has a heart for the common people. And that's really encouraging to the people who live outside of Jerusalem. But then he moves on to Jerusalem in verse eight. In that day, Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And the one who stumbles among them in that day will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of Yahweh before them. Yahweh will defend Jerusalem. God has a heart for the leadership that's in Jerusalem. God is saying to them, you were unfaithful to me in the past. Your your leadership was terribly unfaithful, but I will be faithful to you. And the one who stumbles among them describes the people who at the time of this battle are weak. There are Jews who are going to be there who are physically weak. They're incapacitated for whatever reason. They don't have the strength to walk. They will be like David. David was Israel's best example of what it means to be strong and skillful and courageous. 
So all of these people that are, that are weak and infirm and frail, whether they're very young or they're very old, they will be like David. Just think of David and Goliath and how courageous David was and how God gave him the skill and the ability to take down the most highly trained killer in the world. Just look at 1 Samuel 17 for the details on that. So all of these people will be made to be like David. And the house of David will be like God. We need to make sure we understand what God is not saying here. He's not saying these people are going to be gods or they're going to be like gods. But we need to understand that the priest, and what we're talking about here is the royal line. God will know the royal line. He will be able to explain exactly who they are. They will know who they are in that time. But the, the priest was responsible for representing the people to God. And the king, the one in the royal line, was re responsible for representing God to the people. So to be the house of David, being like God, is to say that, that the house of David, those in the royal line, are actually going to represent God's character to the common people. What that means is they are going to be earnest in their desire to protect and defend Israel. They're going to do it by their fierceness in battle because they are going to be like the angel of Yahweh. The men of Judah will be every bit as zealous to protect Jerusalem as Messiah Jesus himself. They'll be every bit as zealous to protect Jerusalem because they are the family line. They are the ones who represent God to the people. And this section closes in verse 9 with a very encouraging message about the completeness of God's destruction. He says, in that day it will be that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Again, totally obliterate everybody. There won't be pockets of people here, pockets of people there, like you had in the conquest of the promised land. There will be no survivors at all. None of them will escape God's judgment. Not a single one. And there is no conflict in all of human history that has been as lopsided and as one-sided as this. So this is really, really encouraging to the Jew. So we have to ask ourselves, why doesn't the chapter end here? This should be good. The game is over. Everybody's going to be defeated. There are no survivors. Let's go home. Well, the answer is that Judah to this point has only been delivered physically. They haven't been delivered spiritually. They still have the same hard heart towards God. Things are beginning to turn, but they are still characterized with a heart of hardness. So what we were looking at just now was the battle of Armageddon. What we're going to see now is the battle of the Jewish heart. So in the face of annihilation by the greatest military force ever assembled, God not only is going to provide a physical salvation, but he is going to bring a spiritual salvation to his people that is every bit and more important as the physical salvation. And that's what we see in verses 10 through 14. And what we're going to see here is that salvation has always been of God by grace. Salvation has always been of God by grace. We see that here. You see that in Romans chapter 4. It is always of grace by God. But equally importantly is that God's enabling grace is always accompanied by repentance that follows. What we need to understand and what we need to accept this morning is that God's enabling grace enables man to repent and is accompanied by his repentance. So let's look at the first half of verse 10. God's enabling grace. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. Notice and at the beginning. And I. God says there, there's something else here. It's not complete. The job is not done when I've eliminated the armies against you. There's more to be done. And the one that's going to do it is me. I am doing this. What I'm going to do is I am going to pour out my spirit on Israel. This is an inundating outpouring. Think of a water that's being poured into a shallow pan. And think of every part of the bottom of that pan that was previously dry. When you pour the water into it, it becomes covered with water. There is no part that is dry. That's what's going on here. When God pours out his spirit on Israel, there will be wholesale reconciliation of the Jew to God. Next week, we're going to address in chapter 13 what happens to the unbelieving Jews. But for those Jews that believe, there is a wholesale reconciliation. And it's on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
God is going to say here that pedigree has nothing to do with my saving grace. It doesn't matter where you come from. I'm going to do this. I'm going to pour out a spirit of grace. What is taking place here is the picture of regeneration. Grace in the Old Testament means exactly the same thing as it means in our New Testament. We're probably a little more familiar with with its usage in the New Testament, but it means the exact same thing in the Old Testament. It is favor. It's God's unmerited favor. That's exactly what we have here. So if God pours it out, then God determines those on whom he will pour it out. And we'll see that again in chapter 13. But at this point, Israel is spiritually dead and they are unaware of their need for a salvation. They've just seen this massive victory and they're not really aware. But what we're going to see is that regeneration does something within the believer. It makes them want more of what they have. And so God pours out not only a spirit of grace to actually regenerate them, but he pours out upon them a spirit of supplication. So whereas grace is a picture of regeneration, supplication is a picture of sanctification. After regeneration, the Jew is actually able to behold the truth. They can comprehend the truth, the truth that has always been there, but because of the hardness of their own heart and the failure of their their kings and their priests, it was obscured from them. They couldn't see it, but now they actually understand it. And once they understand it, they desire more and more of it. So they ask for it. That's what supplication is, right? It's asking. They're asking for more and more. Give me more understanding of what you've already given to me. I want to know Messiah better than I do right now. Whereas in the past, Israel was running from the truth. Now they're running to the truth and they want more of it. I think there's a good analogy here with a moth and a bat. If you think about a moth and you turn on a light at night outside, the moth is attracted to the light. They come to the light. That's the good part. Think about a bat. He avoids the light at all costs. He doesn't walk around. He doesn't fly around in the day. He's nocturnal. Let's turn to John chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 19 to 21. Jesus is going to be describing those two groups of people. And one of them is regenerate Israel in the Old Testament. The conversation in John chapter 3 continues after verse 16. Jesus keeps talking and he says profound things to Nicodemus. And what he says to them is, starting in verse 19, this is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. So that's the first piece of spiritual salvation. God brings enabling grace. And there's a caution we need to have here as we look at this. And the caution is that there's there's a world of people and the world is full of people who actually know the truth. But a person only understands the truth when they comprehend their sin in light of that truth. One fact we need to remember is that a true comprehension of truth is always accompanied by a true comprehension of your own sin and the offense that sin is against the holy God. One really cannot believe that God reconciles sinful man to himself without acknowledging that it was your sin that estranged you from God in the first place. That's so important for us to know and understand. So the result of truly seeing your sin is repentance because you are grieved over the ugliness of who you are without Christ. So Israel's spiritual salvation always depends on God's enabling grace but it also produces a sorrowful repentance. And that's what we see in the rest of the passage from the second half of verse 10 through verse 14. I'm just going to read verse 10. So they, this is regenerate Israel, will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of a firstborn. It will be to Israel as if their personal sin has made them responsible for Christ's crucifixion centuries, millennia earlier. They will look at this and they will realize it's because of us and what we did. They won't be like Isaiah 53 verse 4 describes where Isaiah writes about Jesus. He carried our sorrows, but the future Jew says, yet we ourselves, us, we esteemed him stricken. We reveled, we rejoiced, 
over his suffering at the cross, even though he was bearing in his own body on that cross our sin. So future Israel will one day comprehend that they have reveled in Christ's death while he was purchasing their salvation for them. And they will mourn for him. And the Hebrew word here is, is describing a wailing, a shrieking, a beating of the chest in grief over your own sin. And you do that the way that one mourns for the loss of an only son. If you're here this morning and you've lost your only son, you know exactly what this means. And there's a bitter weeping. And so with this idea of bitter weeping comes the idea of loathing yourself because of what you personally have done to offend God. It's the same idea of, of godly sorrow that you see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, where it's godly sorrow that leads to repentance. That's the same thing. You're genuinely broken over who you are before God. I'm going to read verses 11 to 14 in, in one setting. And as I read this, Notice a couple of different things. Notice all the different families or groups of people that are, that are mentioned. And then notice the word alone and how often the word alone is used. In that day, there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadad Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. And the land will mourn, each family alone, the family of the house of David alone and their wives alone. The family of the house of Nathan alone and their wives alone. The family of the house of Levi alone and their wives alone. The family of the Shimeites alone and their wives alone. All the families that remain, each family alone and their wives alone. Starts off by the mention of Hadad Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. This is 2 Chronicles 35. This is the story of when King Josiah was wounded in battle and he eventually died. And there was nationwide mourning over his death. Widespread corporate mourning. Same thing is going to be happening here. The whole nation is going to be mourning over their sin. Notice the word alone. The word alone is used 11 times in these four verses. It's a personal, intimate, sincere, quiet inner grieving. There is a right place for a corporate grieving together, a corporate sadness. This is every person realizing what they have done personally in the quietness of their own heart. Each family alone means that each family will repent before God. It'll be individual families who turn away from their sin. The house of David alone, this represents David's royal line David had Solomon through Bathsheba. So that's the royal line that's in view here. They are going to weep over their sin. They are going to grieve over their sin. Their wives are going to grieve over it as well. What that is speaking about is, is normally the, the wife is following the husband as her head. But here she's going to comprehend her sin so completely, so fully, that she's going to mourn on her own. She is not going to follow the lead of her husband. She's going to be already there herself. The house of Nathan alone. This is another son of, of Bathsheba that David had with her. And this is the family line of Mary. So this is David's non-royal line. This is David's bloodline. The house of Levi alone addresses the priestly Levites. The house of Shimeites alone addresses the non-priestly Levites. So you've got the priests and everybody else who is not a priest. Everybody is mentioned here. And finally, he says, all the family that remain. If I haven't covered you in this long list of groupings of people, I'm covering you now. Everybody is going to do this alone. All the families that remain. Every one of them will, will believe. So this is really, really encouraging to the Jew. The Jew knows that God is going to save them physically and God is going to save them spiritually. He is going to extend his grace and they are going to repent from the heart. So that is good news. We have, we have two applications for ourselves this evening. No, let's not do that tonight. Let's do it now. <laughs> we, are, we are in the daytime here, so let's, let's live in the day. Okay, first application. Marvel at the severity and the kindness of God. You read this chapter, you cannot help but marvel at God's severity. Look at what he is going to do against every single member of the army that is gathered against Israel. Ezekiel tells us that Israel will spend seven months cleaning up the mess after this is over. So marvel at that, but also marvel at the kindness of God. 
God alone would pour out his spirit of grace to make you able to see your need for a savior and his spirit of supplication to make you ask for more and more of that same truth, that same knowledge. So marvel at the severity and the kindness of God. Secondly, that we'll do today, just think about this. Assess your response to your own sin in two pieces, one to the Christian, one to the person who is not a Christian. Christian, do you mourn over your sin? When you confess your sin to God, do you mourn over it? Does it break your heart the way it breaks God's heart? Do you humbly confess it to your master? Or do you enlist his grace to walk in newness of life? If you're not a Christian, do you understand your condition before a holy God? Do you understand that he sees you and he knows you? He knows everything about you. Do you understand the true gospel that God saves by grace? And the way that you can tell that God has saved somebody by grace is that they walk in repentance and newness of life. Find a Bible and read it and understand that God loves to use the truth of his word to draw you to himself. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I, I praise you for this story. I praise you for this chapter that you have told us and you have shown us that you and you alone are the one who saves. Lord, there is no one in this world who has any power against you. There is no one who can stand against you. You know all things. I pray for us. Lord, I pray that we would grow in our awareness of our sin. We would grow in our brokenness over our sin. And we would earnestly seek to enlist your grace to walk in newness of life. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.